Okay, so let's consider this question now. You lease a machine on 1st January 2011 for 4 years and pay 100 at the start of every year. Now notice that like most leases, here we are paying at the start of every period. The fair value is 340. The relevant interest rate is 10%. How should this lease be categorized and what is the impact on the financial statements? Assume straight line depreciation. So how do we figure out whether this is an operating lease or a finance lease? The machine is being leased for four years. You pay 100 at the start of every year. So what's the present value? So 100, 100, 100 and 100. These are your four payments at t equal to 0, 1, 2 and 3. Now there are multiple ways to come up with the present value. One is to simply discount each value and then add all the numbers. The other is to say that this is an annuity and you can discount back so and then you can add to 100 so present value is 100 plus so this 100 is the 100 at t0 what is the present value of these three numbers 100 100 100 so to calculate the pv of these 300 payments we can plug in n is 3 the interest rate is 10 percent which is given the payment is 100 so these are three equal payments and other than this last payment there is no other payment over here that's why fv is 0 and when you plug those numbers in you get a present value of 248.685 this is added to the first hundred and you have a present value of 348.685 now this present value is actually higher than the fair value so clearly this is a finance lease you cannot treat this like an operating lease all right now let's look at what you show on the balance sheet and on the other financial statements so we said that the initial value is 348.69 so what do we do on the asset side so initially assets go up by this number and what's the lease payable the lease liability is the same amount 348.69 so the lease liability also goes up by this amount all right so the asset part is easy at the start of 2011 what's the carrying amount it's the number we just said this is being depreciated over four years so where is this number coming from 87.14 it is simply the asset amount divided by four straight line depreciation so over four years essentially we come down to zero so this is just a rounding error okay now the lease liability side is slightly tricky the initial lease liability on 1st January 2011 is 348.69 the first payment is made immediately so on 1st January a payment of 100 is made now this 100 is being made at the start of the year so it is reducing the lease liability by 100 so has any interest accrued on that same day answer is no no interest has accrued so that 100 reduces the lease liability from 348.69 to 248.69 so the entire 100 is being used to reduce the lease liability the interest expense for the prior year this means that on 1st January of 2011 the interest that accrued from last year here is zero because we just got into this agreement what about the second year 2012 the initial lease liability on 1st January is 248.69 the lease payment is 100 that's the regular lease payment now this lease payment of 100 has two components an interest component and a principal component how much is the interest the interest that accrued over the previous year and this is interest for prior year is 10 percent of the lease liability after the hundred was paid after the hundred was paid the lease liability came down to 248.69 what's 10 percent of this 
that is two four uh, that is twenty four point eight seven so twenty four point eight seven is the interest component and the principal component is the balance seventy five point one three and then how do we come up with this number it is two forty eight point six nine minus seventy five point one three so at the end of 2012 this is the lease payable and then this becomes the starting lease payable next year again a payment of 100 is made the interest from last year is 10 percent of this number and we follow through with that process at the end of year four the lease liability also comes down to effectively zero and again we have 0.01 this is just a rounding error so notice what happens over the years we start with an asset and then the asset value over four years comes down to zero and the lease liability we start at 348.69 and this also comes down to zero over four years we've talked about the fact that this is categorized as a finance lease what is the impact on financial statements now these are the carrying amounts on the balance sheet so the asset value will be 348.69 initially and then it will come down so these are the numbers on the liability side of the balance sheet what about the income statement on the income statement we'll show the depreciation expense and we will show the interest expense what about the cash flow statement so on the cash flow statement the lease payment of 100 obviously needs to be shown now every time we make a payment of 100 that's the explicit cash flow but that cash flow is split between CFO and CFF the interest part hits CFO and the part that is paying off the liability the lease payable hits CFF okay the sum is going to be 100 but it hits both the CFO and CFF if this were a operating lease then what would you do then the entire 100 would be shown as as CFO okay and let's actually compare the expenses for a operating lease and a finance lease so same scenario and as you might imagine the CFA Institute likes to ask questions comparing operating leases with finance leases because companies might have some discretion as to how they might categorize. So if a company has categorized a lease as an operating lease, then the expense will be 100 and this would all hit the CFO, fairly straightforward. What about finance lease? With the finance lease, you will have a depreciation amount plus a interest amount, which will give you the total expense. So notice that with the finance lease, initially our expense is greater than the 100 amount, which shows on the operating side. Why? Because we have both depreciation and a relatively high interest expense. Why is the interest expense relatively high? because the amount outstanding is high whereas what happens towards the end in the final two years the outstanding amount has come down depreciation is still there but the interest amount becomes very low and therefore the overall expense becomes low on the finance lease side relative to the operating lease and the sorts of questions that you might get here if you have operating lease versus finance lease, all else equal, where will net income be higher? With the operating lease, our expense is lower initially, so the net income is going to be higher. But towards the end of the lease term, where will the net income be higher? The net income will be higher for the finance lease. So notice that your ratios will be different just based on how we categorize what about assets where will assets be higher assets will be higher with finance lease where will the debt be higher 
again with the finance lease. So here is something that you actually need to memorize but understand first and then memorize comparing finance leases with operating leases. This should be fairly obvious. Assets are higher with finance leases and uh, lower with operating leases. All these are fairly intuitive. Uh, for your benefit, I will just cover these last few items. We've already talked about these. Operating income is going to be higher with a finance lease relative to operating lease. The reason is the entire 100, if we go with the example that we have talked about earlier, that entire 100 is reducing our operating income. Whereas if we treat the lease as a finance lease, the interest part will show up after operating income. Therefore, we have a higher EBIT when we categorize the lease as a finance lease. CFO, cash flow from operations. If you categorize the lease as an operating lease, the entire 100 is reducing CFO. Whereas if the lease is categorized as a finance lease, the 100 is split into a interest amount and a principal amount. Only the interest amount is reducing the the CFO. And then financing, if you categorize as an operating lease, the financing bucket is untouched, so there is no outflow from there. That's why we have a higher amount. The total cash flow of 100 is the same whether you categorize the lease as a finance lease or an operating lease. The ratio impact of leasing is also important and I will let you pause the video and just make sure that these relationships make sense. So the current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. With the operating lease, the current assets and current liabilities are not impacted. What about with a finance lease? The current assets are not impacted, but current liabilities will be higher because you will have lease obligations and the current part of the lease obligations will increase the current liabilities. So overall, your ratio is going to be lower, briefly. So a current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. With uh, operating lease, both these numbers don't change. With a finance lease, the current assets stay the same, but the current liabilities go up because the short-term part of your liability or your lease obligation goes up, so the ratio is low. Working capital is essentially equal to your current assets minus current liabilities. Current assets are staying the same for a finance lease. Current liabilities going up, so the ratio is low. On the operating side, there is no impact to the assets or liabilities. Asset turnover is sales divided by assets. Sales are the same under both methods. Assets will be higher with a finance lease, therefore the ratio is lower. Return on assets is net income divided by assets. As we just saw, the net income for the finance lease in the early years is going to be low. Assets are going to be relatively high compared to an operating lease. So the ratio is lower. Return on equity, net income over equity. Net income for a finance lease in the early years is relatively low. Equity is roughly the same because assets and liabilities go up by the same amount. So the ratio is lower. Debt over assets is slightly tricky. For most companies, the debt will be lower than assets. Let's say that for a company, the debt is 50, the assets are 100 before taking on the finance lease. So our debt to assets ratio is 0 0.5. Then we take on a finance lease where the present value is 10. So our assets and liabilities both go up by 10. We will then have 60 over 110. And this ratio is 0.55 roughly, which is higher. So the ratio becomes higher, which means that our leverage situation is worse because we have more debt per asset. 
And then debt to equity is also higher because uh, debt has gone up when we do a finance lease, but uh, equity is roughly the same because both assets and liabilities go up. Now we move to the lessor side. Everything that we've discussed so far is from a lessee perspective. Now we will talk about a lessor. With an operating lease, the lessor will record the revenue when earned. So what is the revenue for a lessor? It is the lease payments that the lessor is receiving. Report the leased asset on the balance sheet. Why? Because if this is an operating lease, then the asset will remain on the balance sheet of the lessor. The income that he is getting is essentially a rent on that asset. And the expense will be the depreciation of that asset. Since the asset is on the lessor's balance sheet, obviously the asset has to be depreciated. With a finance lease, the first question is how do you categorize? And we go with the same criteria that we discussed earlier, plus we connect with the revenue recognition criteria that we talked about in the reading on income statements. Remember there was a segment there on leases, so we also look at the revenue recognition criteria. Now with a finance lease, in the US GAAP world, we can either categorize a finance lease as a direct finance lease or a sales type lease. With IFRS, we only have a sales type lease. A lot of people get confused about this, but if you pay attention, the concept is fairly straightforward. Remember, though, that we are talking about a lessor. This is the entity that owns the asset. But if we have a finance lease, this essentially means that the lessor is going to sell the asset to the lessee. Now, now, before I get into the terminology, here is a really basic point. When the lessor sells the asset, there are two possible scenarios. Either the selling price is equal to the book value. Obviously, if the asset is on the balance sheet of the lessor, it will have some book value or carrying amount. Let's say that the book value is equal to 100. Now, it is possible that the selling price, and the selling price here would be the present value of all the lease payments. So one scenario is that the present value of the lease payments equal the book value. The other scenario is that the selling price, which is the present value of the payments, is greater than book value. Okay, these are the two scenarios. If you have the first scenario where the selling price is equal to book value, then we say that we have a direct finance lease. This is called direct finance lease because the lessor is purely making money based on financing. The book value is 100. The present value of all the lease payments is 100. So is the lessor making money? Yes, but that money is purely coming based on interest payments, purely based on financing. So that's why in the US GAAP world, this is called a direct finance lease. What does the lessor record on his balance sheet when this happens? The lessor records a lease receivable. So the asset is sold and a lease receivable is recorded. So what happens on the balance sheet? The asset is removed, and what is added? The lease receivable. And the lease receivable is equal to the book value of the asset, so there is no change in equity. There is no profit recorded upfront. The other scenario is where the present value of lease payments is more than the book value. So let's say that the present value of lease payments is 120. Now what will happen initially? The lessor is removing an asset which has a book value of 100 and the lessor will receive a present value that is 120. Now of that 120, 20 is going to be shown as a profit on the sale because that present value is more than the book value. That's what people do when they sell. When they sell, if the money that they receive is more than book value, that difference is the profit. 
with a sales type lease, money is being made in two ways. One is the profit because the present value is more than the book value. And then the other way of making money is the interest revenue. So as I mentioned earlier, this distinction is a US gap distinction. IFRS says that we only have sales type leases. If you say sales type lease where the book value is equal to the selling price, then how do you think IFRS will deal with this? IFRS will simply say that the profit is zero. And if the profit is zero, then how is money being made? It's simply being made on financing. Now let's look at an example that we saw earlier, but from the lessor perspective. You lease a machine for four years and receive 100 at the start of every year. The interest rate is 10%. What are the accounting entries assuming this is a direct financing lease? Okay, so how does this work? As we calculated earlier, the lease receivable is 348.69. So we take the four payments of 100. So the first one is at time zero, and then one, two, three, four, hundred, hundred, and hundred. And when we take the present value of these four payments that we will receive, that number is 348.69. The first payment that we get is on 1st January. So that's 100. Now, since it's 1st January and the lease just happened, there is no interest that accrued last year. So the entire 100 goes towards reducing the lease receivable. So now our lease receivable is 348.69. All right, that becomes the starting lease receivable the next year. Again, on 1st January, we get 100. Now, where does this interest income come from? Earlier, this was an expense from the perspective of the lessee, but now from the perspective of the lessor, this is income. So 24.87 is 10% of this number all right so of the hundred this is the interest income and the rest 75.13 goes towards reducing the lease receivable so our lease receivable then comes down to 173.58 we follow the same procedure and end up with a lease receivable of zero at the end of four years so you can think of this as a mirror image of what we discussed earlier the difference is that here we have interest income and earlier we had interest expense what are some basic disclosures lease disclosures show payments under both capital and operating leases for the next five years and after that so you will see obviously capital lease related information on the balance sheet but then there will be lots of details in the disclosure showing over the next five years what are the payments after that what are the payments do you think operating leases need to be disclosed in the footnotes they do so even though it's off balance sheet but in the disclosures a company needs to specify what are the operating leases and what are the terms and conditions under which those operating leases exist. You as an analyst can then take that information and then say what if the company had capitalized these leases. Is that something you can do? If you look at operating leases and you believe that the company really should have capitalized, what can you do? You can look at all that future payment and then figure out what's the corresponding asset and liability. Okay, so disclosures can help estimate extent of a company's of balance sheet lease financing through operating leases. Is it conceivable that a company is showing really good efficiency in terms of net income over assets, which is ROA, but then when you look at the disclosures, you can find out that the company has lots of lease obligations, right? Then suddenly the picture might not look as rosy.